Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to introduce uh, the co-chairs of Working Group 2, who have been the stewards of this entire activity, Dr. Martin Parry, Dr. Oswaldo Canziani, and uh, there's Dr. Renata Christ, who's the secretary of the IPCC. Uh, let me first apologize for keeping you waiting, but as you know, we've had a long session all through the night, and you know, at the end of this uh, enormous effort, we have what we think is an excellent report. And it's, uh, it deals with the subject that I think is really at the core of everything to do with climate change, because the Working Group 2 report deals with impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. And this is what determines uh, responses that human beings and societies will make to, um, to counter this problem, to be able to manage this problem. Um, I just wanted to mention the size of this effort. Uh, there are 174 lead authors who worked on this report. There were 222 contributing authors. There were 45 review editors. The report itself is uh, printed, um, it's typed pages, 1,572 pages, and the summary for policymakers, which you'll be receiving very soon, essentially is a summary of this huge volume that's produced through the effort of so many distinguished scientists from all over the world. Why is this particular report of significance? Well, firstly, because it clearly assesses the impacts of climate change in different parts of the world. And this time, far beyond what we were able to achieve in the third assessment report of the IPCC, we have far greater regional detail. And these details cover things like the melting of glaciers in different parts of the world, projections on what the implications of that melting are going to be, sea level rise, which clearly threatens a large number of countries in the world, uh, the small island states in particular, but also those that have large coastlines, and in cases, low coastlines. There are mega deltas that are particularly vulnerable, and those have been identified in this report. There are going to be impacts on agriculture. Those have been assessed and quantified, and all of this has important implications for food security. Um, and there's a much larger dimension that, that I think the impacts of climate change bring to the fore in a very focused manner. And that's the equity dimensions of the problem. Is the poorest of the poor in the world, and this includes poor people even in prosperous societies, who are going to be the worst hit and who are the most vulnerable as far as the impacts of climate change are concerned. And I think this uh, certainly requires attention because people who are poor are least equipped to be able to adapt to the impacts of climate change. And therefore, in some sense, this does become a global responsibility in my view. Um, I will leave the details of the report to uh, those who have led this effort. Dr. Martin Parry and Dr. Oswaldo Tanziani, but I will be here for a while to answer any questions that you might have. And I'd like to end by thanking you for being here and apologizing once again for keeping you waiting so long. But, you know, we've all been working through the night. I'm wearing the same clothes that I wore in the morning yesterday. And, of course, I haven't had a shave, as you might notice. So, Anyway, thank you for being here. Hello. We're now going to have a PowerPoint presentation by, by Martin Perry, one of the co-chairs of the working group.
Uh, this uh, report is called Climate Change Impacts, Vulnerability and Adaptation. Climate Change 2007. It's the second of three reports by the IPCC. As you probably know, Working Group 1 was published, uh, was approved a month ago in Paris. Some of you are probably there. This is Working Group 2 on impacts and Working Group 3 is in Bangkok in, uh, in a month's time. <clears throat> and we've just surfaced uh, from four days and uh, last night and we have approval of our document and we literally meet in uh, an hour's time with clean copy uh, of that. The heroes of this are the, are the authors, not uh, um, the bank managers like uh, Dr. Canziani and myself, but the, the troopers who've done it, the uh, two or three hundred scientists over about five years. I just want to show you some results uh, from this. <clears throat> The, uh, the report is published by Cambridge University Press in the summer. Uh, hard copies of the uh, summary for policymakers we approve in an hour's time, so unfortunately we can't give them to you now. But I'll give you some of the basics, if I may. Uh, I've got someone here to press the buttons. Andy here said to me, for goodness sake, apologize in advance, because the adrenaline's uh, run out now, and we're, we're sort of floating on our feet a little bit, so this will not be a polished presentation. Firstly, <coughs> Uh, some real troopers have done some work, and they're in this room, uh, by the way. Drs. Casasa uh, from Chile, uh, Rosenzweig from the Goddard Institute in uh, New York City, and Caroli, also from the U.S., and they're here to answer questions, have done some work bringing together what we know about the impacts of observed climate change, climate change happening now. If you track through the IPCC, Five years ago, it concluded that there was a, uh, no, ten years ago, a detectable anthropogenic effect on climate, ten years ago. Five years ago, Rosenzweig and others um, identified a discernible regional effect of climate change. That is, for example, an area like Europe, that warming was having an effect on insect movements, on phenology of plants, on water levels and so on in lakes. What they've done now is finally establish that at the global level there is an anthropogenic, a man-made climate signal coming through on plants, animals, water and ice. This is the first time at the international level and for the IPCC that there has been confirmed this signal. We read, of course, and you probably write a lot about hmm, pigeon flies over Trafalgar Square one way rather than the other. It must be climate change or something like that. But it's very difficult to put that information together. <clears throat> and this is what they've done. They've firstly <clears throat> confirmed that on all continents there's a regional signal. Regional climate change is affecting animals, plants and so on. And secondly, they've concluded that at the global level this is doing the same. That's an important Conclusion, really, because for the first time, we're no longer arm-waving with models. This might happen, right? This is what we call empirical information on the ground. We can measure it. Next slide. <clears throat> this is the sort of thing they've been looking at. Uh, the one line indicates is the climate getting warmer. This is in Western Europe. Another line indicates leaf unfolding of silver birch. And another line indicates leaf unfolding of the horse chestnut, as we call it. There's lots of these graphs, insect behavior, bird migration, dates of bird laying, but finally they've all been put together into a global story. Next slide. <clears throat> this is the sort of thing that is common around the world, but this is the first time that statistically the case has been proven. <clears throat> 29,000 data sets this group used, and more than 90% of them are in the direction that would be expected for climate change. Here's a glacier high in, just going back, glacier high in Bolivia. On the left hand side, 1940, you can see the ski toe. It was the highest skiing um, field in the Alps. 1982 on the top right, 1996, and the snow field's gone now. Well, a lot of people were arguing this is, you know, re just the regional issue, um, less snowfall, a precipitation issue, but conclusively now the IPCC. Both one last month and two now has put this into a world story. Next slide. 
and this is the sort of map they produce. It's very detailed, but it plots these 29,000 uh, data sets all around the world. The great majority...